amen, good singing, you may be seated. And I think that's something that we can really reflect on, especially today. As we look back at the history of our church, we can look back through all these years and say, God has been good to us every single year, hasn't he? There have been some years that are harder than others, but one constant that remains is God. God never changes. God is always, always good. Well, I know that we are tired, and I know that we've had a lot to eat. I know that it's warm in here, and I know that it's comfortable, at least a little bit comfortable, with half of that pew being padded. So I promise I won't keep us too long. But let's just get through a few more of these founding principles. Don't worry. If, if, it's, if it's getting difficult for all of us to stay awake, we might end a little bit early and then just finish this up next Sunday. But I would like to turn our attention back here because, again, this is what is primary. It is good to fellowship together. It's good to sing hymns together. It's good to do all of these things and pray. But what has to be foundational to all that we do is the study of Scripture, the understanding of what God means by what he says, because this is the only thing that will keep us faithful to the founding principles. If we want to remain faithful as a church, it's only as we remain faithful to the word of God. And as we work through this passage in Ephesians, you can turn there if you'd like, Ephesians chapter 4. As we're working through this, we saw, first of all, that the basis for our fellowship and unity as a church is in how we treat each other, how we view each other. So first of all, we've talked about the unity that comes from behavior. And now we're looking at verses 4 through 6, the unity that comes from doctrine. All believers are part of the same body. We all belong to this one body, this body of Christ. We're all indwelt by one Holy Spirit. There's only one Holy Spirit that indwells all of us as believers. And verse 4 brings us to our next point. You are called in one hope of your calling. And what is this teaching us? Number three, every single person who belongs to this same body is Holy Spirit sealed and guaranteed the same future. And what is that future that all of us look forward to? Here's a big word for us, glorification. And what is that? What is future glorification? We, if we speak of kind of like the trajectory of, of faith, we would say it begins with salvation, continues in sanctification. And when does sanctification conclude? On this side of heaven? You say, I wish, no. When does our sanctification finally reach its, its fulfillment? In heaven, in this moment of glorification. And all of us as believers have this same future. And this is what all of us are looking forward to. Again, this is what unites us. Romans 8, 29 to 30. For whom he did foreknow, he, God, also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Our calling as believers is not just to salvation. That's important for us to see. And our calling as believers is not just to sanctification. There's more than that. Our calling as believers is nothing short of glorification. God's purpose in saving you was not just to give you a home in heaven, was not just to change you a little bit during this life. God's purpose and ultimate goal in saving you is to someday transform you into Christ's very likeness. One day you and I will be like Christ. You say, right now we're, we're trying to grow in Christ's likeness, but someday that will be complete in heaven, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. This is our calling. And this calling is through the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how exactly is the Holy Spirit involved in this calling? Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, and to the praise of his glory. Just like a seal secured a letter's safe delivery. If you would see this back in, in the Roman times, there would be a scroll or there would be some parchment, and it was sealed with this wax seal. And what was the purpose of that? Yes, you would know who sent it, but what was the purpose of that seal? Would you know if anybody had read your mail? Well, yes, because the only way to open that letter was to break that seal. So that seal guaranteed that it, it was going to receive safe delivery. It's interesting that, that God uses this same terminology about the Holy Spirit in relationship to us. 
Just like a seal secured a letter's safe delivery, the Holy Spirit secures us for our future glorification. It's like each one of us are stamped with this Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our safe delivery. The Holy Spirit is also the earnest of our inheritance. You've heard of earnest money? If you want to purchase something and someone says, how do I know that you're really going to make good on this? You give them what? A down payment. I'm giving you this money and this is how you can trust me. I don't want to lose that however much money it is. Just like a down payment guarantees possession, the Holy Spirit guarantees our future inheritance. Isn't that great? This is the Holy Spirit's promise of the hope of our calling. So how does this apply to us as believers? How is this bedrock for the foundation of our faith? Can we recognize that every single believer who belongs to this same body is Holy Spirit sealed and guaranteed the same future that we are? And we can talk about other believers now and say, you know what, I guess I just have to get along with them. Well, how long are we going to be with them? <laughs> if they're true believers, forever. And this is the promise that we all share, that same future that we all look forward to. This glorification is for each one of us. It's the hope that every true believer shares. What's the next founding principle that we must not deviate from? One Lord. Number four, every single person who belongs to this same body serves the same master. The word that's translated Lord here is the Greek word kurios. It means literally master. One who is in the position of supreme authority. You say, well, what does being in this body and being under Christ's lordship practically look like? It looks like a life of obedience to his commands. Luke 4, 46 through 49. Jesus says this, why do you call me master, master? Can we read it that way? Why are you calling me master and not doing the things that I say? He's saying, do you see the inconsistency of this? Don't call me your boss if you're not submitting to me. Don't call me your master if you're not obeying me. Why are you calling me Lord but not doing what I tell you to do? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you what he is like. And then Jesus gives this familiar parable. He's like a man which built a house and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Does the song come to mind as we read through this verse? <laughs> the wise man built his house upon the rock, right? We, we sing this as children. Well, this is what it's illustrating. Jesus is saying, this person that builds his house on a firm foundation, that's the person that hears my commands and does them. That's what it looks like to be under my lordship, verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not, that's the person that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, or as we say it sometimes in that song, house upon the sand, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Now we can sing that song and sometimes miss the whole point, can't we? We say, okay, so build your life upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can even sing those words. But what does that mean? How do you build your life upon the Lord Jesus Christ? You obey what he tells you to do. That's the life that has a firm foundation. There can be lots of people who claim that Jesus is their master. What does Jesus say? Many will say unto me in that day, Lord Lord, that's that same word. Master, master, didn't we do many mighty works in your name? And Jesus says, I will say to them, what? Depart from me, I never knew you. Lip service is not what God is looking for here. There can be lots of people who claim that Jesus is their master. And from the outside, it may be hard for us to distinguish those who truly are obeying and serving the Lord and those who are not. Those two houses can look identical from the outside, can't they? Their lives might look identical on the outside. The two houses can both look the same. But the difference is when the storms of life come. The storms, the trials, the difficulties reveal whether the foundations, the moorings of that life are genuine or superficial. If Jesus is your Lord and Master, you obey what he tells you to do. And what does Jesus say? If you love me, my commands are not grievous. If you love me, you want to do what I tell you to do. And you will withstand the trials of life. 
And as a true believer, you share this in common with all other true believers. We all serve the same master. This is important for us to remember. And remember the divisions that Paul was dealing with? Some of you are saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Apollos. And others say, I'm of Christ. Who really is the master? We all serve Christ. He is our master. And as as fellow believers, we share this all in common. Well, I promised I wouldn't keep us later than I had to, and I can see that we're getting tired. But where do we draw application from all of this? As believers, can we see these doctrines in Scripture and say this is what we hold to as faith? This is what our church is built on. How do we keep from compromise? We hold tightly to the word of God in all of these areas. I see my fellow believers this same way. I relate to fellow believers in this same way because this is what our church is built upon. This is the true church, not just Westview. Westview is a part of the whole church, the church universal that God has laid this foundation for. And There's no other foundation than Christ. Let's hold to these truths of the word of God. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we do have absolute truth, and I pray that you would help us to cling tightly to it. Please help us to not compromise. Please help to live lives of obedience to your word and to what you've called us to do in all of these ways. In Jesus' name, amen.